there anymore. All right, anybody here? Okay, Ron, good to see you, Ron. I'm glad that you joined us. Um, thank you guys for coming out. I'm just gonna introduce a special person. This is Christopher Phelps. Christopher Phelps. Um, he is an engineer. I'm gonna give you a background, a short background. He's gonna give you basically his own background, but um, this is an engineer. He has a bachelor's science in mechanical engineering from uh, North Carolina A and T, right? And then he went to Drexel. <laughs> he went to Drexel University. Shout out to uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, the Dragons. Okay, he got he received his master's. I'm assuming in also in mechanical engineering. Actually, for my master's degree, I got my MBA. I got my MBA. Oh, master's degree in, bu in business. Okay. And he operates two businesses. <laughs> He's competed um, and won fights, sanctioned fights, and kickboxing and mixed martial arts. He's a well-rounded person. We're going to focus on the fact that he's an engineer that follows Christ. I'm so happy. Um to introduce to you Christopher Phelps. I'll, I'll give a couple of people more time to join us on Phenomenal Stemist. But welcome, welcome to Phenomenal Stemist, Chris. Yeah, it's a, definitely a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, me and Maya are really good friends. Uh, I, I thoroughly respect this woman. She's extremely educated, very sweet person. She, she loves God, and um, I really appreciate um, her ministry as far as getting um, minorities into um, I would say into the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math, and also like the fact that she's very uh, politically active as far as like <laughs> people uh, registered to vote. So, uh, Maya, <laughs> you always have a soldier in me. Okay, I love you, girl. Cool. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, thanks for joining, guys. We're gonna get right into it. We're gonna talk about um, your love for your field. Um, when did you fall in love with your discipline? When did you fall in love with your discipline? Okay, so I'll go ahead and I'm, I'm a pretty honest, blunt guy. Most people from Philly are, most guys who grew up in the Northeast are. So I'm going to be completely honest with you guys about a lot of the responses that I give you. Um, so I fell in love with engineering very, very early in my life. I remember being probably three or four and asking my older brother, um, when I was looking at a picture of the pyramids, who built the pyramids? And he said, engineers from Egypt. Hmm. Um, I remember being about five or six. And um, one of my, I remember about being about five or six, and I saw this humongous, a uh, wall on top of um, these mountains in China. So I asked that same brother, uh, Norman, who built the uh, Great Wall of China. He said, engineers in China. So as a little kid, I always knew that um, engineers built, for lack of a better word, really cool stuff. Wow. They um, got to design things that people the world over could look at. Um, I haven't been to China yet, but I had been to the pyramids. And not to nerd out too much, but there are a lot of things about the pyramids to this day that people, even engineers, cannot figure out how they built it. And to me, it's pretty dope that they built these things Literally, they don't know whether five or 10,000 years ago and they're still standing. So yeah. I fell in love with engineering very, very early on. And secondly, as a black male, I, I quickly realized when I got to uh, elementary that there were a lot of subjects that I might think that for lack of a better word were kind of racist. So if my teacher didn't like me, um, and I wrote a really, really phenomenal paper about, say, slavery or, say, about the Holocaust, and they didn't like me, they basically said, hey, I'll get a B or C. Hmm. Whereas engineering, whereas engineering, and more importantly, math, whether I, they like me or not, one plus one was always going to be Always two. two. That's right. That's right. It's not subjective. That is so true. That is so, it's not subjective. And that's the beauty of STEM. One plus one will always be two. And whether they like you or not, they can't change their grade based on whether they like you or not. I love that answer. Hmm, good answer. All right, number two. Um, what tools uh, did you use to discipline yourself? So we know that STEM um, requires a lot of discipline. Um, it's not easy. Right. What? Give me some tools that you use to discipline yourself. Well, I think that there's a couple of different ones, but I would say um, the one thing that God gives us that he doesn't give this world is time. You can always get more money, and you can always get, um, in some extent, you can always get more money. You can always get more money. You can always get more a nice car, a nice house. Time is one you can't get more of. So I would say a resource that I learned to use very early on in my life was time management. Mm. So um, I think earlier, Maya, when you were asking me, basically, um, you mentioned uh, me being uh, an, uh, an amateur uh, fighter, and I got offers to fight professionally um, 
and boxing and kickboxing and mixed martial arts competitions. I got to that point in my life because I was always an athlete. I played basketball, I played football, I ran track. And early in my life, I realized that if I was going to play sports and, and, be a good, and be a good student, I needed that outstanding time management. Mm. So one resource and one tool that I had to use was I had to have outstanding time management skills. So that was one thing that I definitely had to use um, throughout my time matriculating as an engineer. So that was one tool that I used. So time management, I, I maximized every second of every day of what I was doing with my time. I love that. So it's not that you didn't, you weren't involved in sports, right? But you learned, you learned who um, got priority. You learned how to manage your time properly from an early age. Exactly. No one thing took precedent over the other. Uh, well, actually, I think I did. I, I'm sure your schooling took precedent over the other, but you made sure uh, that you managed your time, that you knew. Exactly how much time that you could put in sports versus how much time you needed to study. You didn't put things on the backboard burner. No, nah, not, not at all. And I also realized, too, that like if I was dating a girl or if I was doing something in my church or I was doing, playing basketball, playing track, or doing whatever, there was a certain amount of time I could devote to something, and I needed to have whatever I was done done at that point. And if I didn't have it done, I would just stay up later or get up earlier to basically do what I wanted to do. So um, time management skills have been something that I started practicing very early in my life because of playing sports and um, because of being involved in like, communities, being involved in church and stuff like that. And there was a skill that I had to master as I became an engineer. When I got to undergrad, when I got to grad school, these are all things I had to basically pick up and do, do, do bigger, better. Engineering is very hard. It's not easy. That's it right. Nice. Number one, I, I, I agree with you on that. Time management was crucial for me. Time management was crucial uh, for me, and that was a great tool that I hope that you were able to convey to parents. Um, you have to teach your kids how to manage their time appropriately, and that may be you not being a procrastinator. You may you you may need to model to your children how to manage time wisely. You were saying something, yeah. Chris. And another thing too, um, I, I know I, that I learned early on too is that sometimes time management is as simple as writing down what you have actually get done. So if you have 15 things you have to do in one day, if you never write them down, you might get five or six accomplished. But if you know you get those 15 things you have to get done, you're going to write them. If you write them down, okay, I finished that, I finished that, I finished that, okay, I'm not going to finish this today, so I'm going to move this to tomorrow. I can't hang out with her today. If I can't hang out with him today, so I'm going to do this, I'm going to hang out with him tomorrow. I can't lift weights today and run. I'm going to lift weights today and run tomorrow. So to me, it was all about time management, and that is what got me through it. I love that. It's so important. Like I used to have a, a calendar with with like time from five in the morning to 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 you know midnight, whatever. And every block had a time that what I was doing, whether it was sleeping, I'm sleeping from this time to this time. You can't interrupt my sleep. I'm in class from this time to this time, and everything else would fit in. Time management is like the foundation. It's so it's so true. It's so much the foundation. Okay, let's look at number. My next question for you is, what were your challenges in school? What were your challenges? Um, I'll answer that, but before I answer that, also one other tool that I also wanted to talk about is okay. Maya was um, you asked me what got me through. Um, you have to find a community that's going to support you throughout that process. So, for mm -hmm. instance, I was a mechanical engineer, and I would be lying to you guys if I said that most of the offices I work in, people look like me. Um, so what I had to do was, and I would also be lying to you if I said um, that most of the classes that I took, people more or less kind of looked like me. It was um, not necessarily like that. So I basically had to find communities and groups like the National Society of Black Engineers, the National Black MBAs, in some cases, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, even the Latino, even kicking over like Latino people and other minority groups. I hung out with people who basically had already graduated and finished the process and had gone through. Why? Because when I was 18 or 19, I wanted to see 23, 24, 25 year old engineers that had made it. I wanted to see, at 25, I wanted to see 30 year old business owners. I wanted to see people who were going to be where I wanted to be. So surrounding yourself with other people who have done what you went through, since you went through the process, and you also basically um, are going to be there to support you when you want to quit. That was something else that kind of got me. Amazing. That's so true. So you built you built a network of people who have succeeded. So you can like look and get advice from them. You 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 seek you sought out mentors. Yep. Right? You sought out mentors. That's the a mentors did not they didn't all they didn't, they didn't always look like me. Mm -hmm. once again I found um 
proverbial way, I found Hispanic engineers, I found white engineers, I found Asian engineers, I found engineers that weren't Christian. Um, in general, everybody is superior to you at something. That's something I learned with sports taught me that everyone is better than you at something in life, whether they look like you or not. So I try to find people who were on the path that I was on or they had already passed that path. That, and I saw what they did basically is where I wanted to do. So, I, so you basically went out, came out your comfort zone Absolutely. and didn't just Absolutely. gather Absolutely. people that just look like you. Whoever succeeded, no matter what they look like, no matter what they believe, if they can help you in some kind of way, you, you networked with them. That was a very Absolutely. important tool. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Back. So, so what were some challenges? Challenges in school. I mean, um, the only folks on the challenges in school. Is in school. Challenges in like school. Career, okay? In school first. Yeah. Uh, I would say this. Um, I'll be completely honest with you guys. Being a guy in college, A and T had a lot of beautiful women. You know, a lot of beautiful women. <laughs> and um, hey, there were many parties that I missed. There were many events that I did not go to. There were many girlfriends that I lost. There were many uh, relationships that I had to cancel because I made it clear that I wanted to basically finish college in four years. I was there on scholarship, and I don't know what the percentage was. At, um, and most. Um, undergraduate colleges as far as graduating in four years, but I can tell you this, very few engineers graduate in four years. Um, and at uh, my particular college, I had, to, I had to graduate in four years in order to do my scholarship. So there were many semesters where I was taking 17, 18, hour, 18 credit hours, 19 credit hours, and things like that in order to graduate. I was taking classes in the summer. So I missed a lot of parties. I missed a lot of social aspects. I missed a lot of, uh, there were a lot of girlfriends that I lost. But I can honestly say this, and this is why I tell all guys when I'm mentoring them, high school, college, whatever. Um, the parties get a lot better once you graduate. <laughs> um, people, it's serious, I'm serious. The people, they become a lot more attractive once you have a lot of money in the bank. They become your experiences in life, the countries you can visit. The, I talked about Egypt. I've been to Egypt. I talked about uh, Latin America. I've been there. I talked about Europe. I backpacked across Europe. So all the quote unquote parties and that I missed, all the quote unquote um, girlfriends that I lost. The things in life get much better if you apply yourself. Um, Absolutely. So that, those are some of the things. Those are some of the challenges. The second challenge I had was that um, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Any STEM field is very hard. There are a reason why a lot of people start um, as a molecular biologist. They start as an electrical engineer. They start as a science major. They start in pre-med and they don't finish. Because a lot of people, when you start getting those classes and you start seeing test scores that you've never gotten in your life, it's not easy. On top of that, um, a lot of your friends who quote unquote aren't in STEM field, you're seeing them partying every night. They're going out every night. They they got the, the dating the women you want to date. It's a it's a serious sacrifice. And that's one reason why I said earlier, make sure that you surround yourself with people who have already graduated or who are gonna graduate. Make sure you start finding those engineers and you start finding those doctors. You start finding those people who um, are a few years older than you. They went through the exact same struggle you went through, and now they're living in the condo in downtown Brooklyn. They're living, um, they're getting the job opportunities to work in Silicon Valley. They're getting the job opportunities to work at this hospital or at this university. So surround yourself with both sides of people and say, wait a minute, they got to, I can do Right. It's, um, it's hard. I was, just like you, bro, I was taking 21, I, in my sophomore year, I took 21 credits per semester. I was taking organic, uh, and I got straight A's. I, you'd be surprised when you challenge yourself to the next level. I took organic, genetics, and physics in the same semester, plus other things that I needed to graduate in four years just like you. It's, it's no joke. You have to sacrifice a lot. But, yeah, yeah I, 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 the parties, oh, I don't go to parties that much. But I, life is better when you're, when, when you're not struggling. I, That's the I, truth. I that. Struggle in yeah, struggle in college, and and live well after. Yep. And the respect, the amount of respect that you can get when you say I'm a doctor, like uh, Dr. Butler, <laughs> the amount of respect you get when you say I'm an engineer, I'm a lawyer, or whatever, whatever your particular trade is. I can tell you right now, that feels a lot better than saying, yeah, I started off in uh, engineering, I and I became something else. Yeah, I started off in such and I quit. So um, it's definitely worth it. Whatever your version of partying is, if it's traveling the world, if it's um, snowboarding, whatever it is, it gets a lot more fun once you have a legit career behind you. Absolutely. Absolutely. No stress. I love that. I love that answer. Okay, so what are your challenges now in your career? Well, well. Um, first of all, tell me what you, first of all, tell me what you do. I didn't talk about what you actually do for a living. 
Cool, cool. So I'm on mechanical, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, plumbing, and fire protection engineer. So to make a long story short, I designed mechanical systems for high-rise buildings, for churches, for schools, people's homes, things like that. So if you've, ever, if you've ever been in the Guggenheim Museum, I was one of the engineers that worked in the uh, HVAC systems for that museum. If you've ever been to the Barnes Art Museum in Philadelphia, Guggenheim's in New York City. If you've ever been to the uh, Barnes Art Museum in um, Philadelphia, I was one of the engineers who basically designed the uh, HVAC systems, the heating, the ventilation, the air conditioning systems for that. If you've ever been to, um, if you've ever been to the American Airlines Arena in Miami, I was one of the engineers who did calculations, the gold calculations on that. I also helped select some of the equipment. If you've ever been to um, different churches all across Philadelphia, if you've ever been to different um, mega uh, mega churches uh, across uh, South Miami, across South Florida, I've been one of the engineers that have worked on those. So basically, my job is to make your body as comfortable as possible um, by treating the air, by um, heating it if you're in the wintertime, cooling the air if you're in the summertime. I also work on the plumbing and the fire protection systems for the building as well. So I make the building literally come to life for you. I want you to, I want to, I, before we talk about your challenges, as, as African Americans, and, and I'm not trying to degrade any other field. Please, please don't make, please don't believe that I'm trying to say that any other field is less than. But we are targeted as technicians. We are targeted um, as fixers, right? But not the builders. See, there, you, there's people who work in, in, the, in air conditioning fields and, 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 and HVAC fields, but they're usually technicians. Right, you can build these things. If you want to be you, I want you to tell your boys that not only can you fix them, you can be involved in the creation of them. Yes, it's going to take a little bit more time, right? But you're going to you make more money when you're the engineer. Same same air condition. One is fixing them, and the other person is building them. And what they do is they target it. They target our boys to be the fixers. No, we want we want our boys to be the builders. And here's an example of a guy that that actually does that. Okay, so just what? To, yeah. Just to piggyback off what you were saying, Maya. Um, for instance, you can be the guy who drives the Bugatti, or you can be the guy who designs the Bugatti. Right. You can be the guy who. Um, Works on the Bugatti, or you can be the guy that says, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna make the 2019 version of the Bugatti." Right. And if you're the engineer, you're the one who basically designs the Bugatti. If you're the technician, you're the one who basically changes the tire and works on it. Right. So um, I tell everybody, uh, God calls us to be the leader, not the follower, the head, not the tail. So as a result, um, I've always kind of thought that biblically, there is something about being the one who basically is in the front of the pack. You're the tip of the spear. You're the one who basically is the leader of the pack. And um, that's one of the things I love about being an engineer. I get to sit in rooms and say, okay, they went with this type of system the last job. It didn't work. These are the pros and cons of the system. Now we're going to figure out how we're going to make it better. That's, that's great. That's great. You, you can do that. You guys can do that. It's going to take a little bit more time and effort, but you guys can do that. All right? So, so what, are your what are your challenges? Well, well um, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. Um, I would like to tell you that once you graduate and get a degree, and um, and Maya, I know being a female and a black woman, that you probably deal with this more than I. Um, but I, I would like to tell you guys that um, once you get your degree, everyone treats you the same. Everyone treats you equal. It doesn't happen like that. I've been called a nigger to my my first day out of college. I was called a nigger by my boss. Mercy. Um, I've, had jobs, I've, had, I've had jobs where um, my boss has told me the only way I'm going to get promoted. Is if I kiss the behind, it ends up, and they didn't. They did not say the behind. <laughs> right. If they get, if I kiss the behind of a person who was literally had half as much experience as I did and no credentials. Mm. So if you know anything about the engineering industry, um, you know you have to pass certain tests or whatever to get become a licensed registered engineer. So I was being told that in order to get promoted, I needed to basically kiss the behinds of a person who had none of the credentials that I had, mm. and also had half as half the experience that I did. Mm. So um, I, I've had situations where everyone in the company is quote unquote doing something, and I'm being told that if I do that same thing, I can get reprimanded significantly for it. Yeah. So there are lots of challenges. Uh, there's a challenge of um, basically you go to work the day after George Zimmerman everything gets off of murder and Trayvon Martin, and all your coworkers are saying, yeah, he was innocent, and you have to basically professionally disagree with them without going off. Right. Um, I, I, I can tell you guys that as a minority, there are situations you're going to go through that, unfortunately, it's not fair. It's just the way that it is. And um, 
the thing that I can tell you that's going to get you through this is first and foremost, um, or if you're African American, if you're Latino, if you're a female of any two, the generation before got it a lot harder than we did. That's the first thing. And then secondly, God doesn't take you to something that can bring you through. Amen. So um, you have to learn how to use your experience as a minority to make you to as fuel to get through to whatever fires that are going to come your way. Um, so that's a challenge. And secondly, I would say um, other challenges that you're going to deal with is that you are probably going to have to work a little harder than the rest of your coworkers and not get fired. So in order to get promoted, you have to work twice as hard as they do in some situations. We call that the black tax. Yep, exactly. The black the black tax, white privilege, the benefits of us not getting white privilege, whatever you want to call it. And that is very prevalent in corporate America. Having said that, um, I mean, we just had an African-American president. Um, I believe that there's more minorities now sitting on boards and whatever that has probably ever been in this country. So things are slowly starting to change with the help of Dr. Um, Byfield right here and a few other minorities like myself. There are people who look like us that are starting to see it in higher and higher positions. That's why we want more of you guys basically matriculate that the Senate bill so they start seeing more and more of us. But there are, are a lot of black engineers, I hate to say that. I've had situations where I walk into conventions and everyone knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only black guy. <laughs> or I'm the only African American, uh, whatever. So yeah, I've seen situations like that. Um, but I also believe that things are slowly getting better. And um, no matter what you're going through, it was way worse 20 years ago. It was way worse yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, and females, all my ladies out there, you're a female and you're a woman. So the stuff that I've experienced, I only experience it from a, um, from a I guess, racial. Uh, type of perspective. Um, if you're a female, unfortunately, you're gonna probably you could probably potentially get a racial and a sexist um, angle as well. But you can get through it. Um, God is equipped you with the tools and the strength to get through it. And um, you will, if you work hard and if you continue to do what got you to that position. That's that that is so good. I'm enjoying. I see a lot of people here um, and commenting and really enjoying what you're saying, Chris. Um, we can make it. We can definitely make it. Um, we can fight through um, what seems. I, I always say this, like, <laughs> not to get political, but if my if my dad is on watching, <laughs> if my dad can handle Reagan, I can handle Trump. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not that much Amen. different. Amen to that. Amen to that. You know, so we we gotta do what we gotta do. We're in a better situation as before. All right, so. Let's look at the last question I have for you. What's your what's the favorite part? What's the favorite part of your career? I would say the dopest thing about being an engineer is kind of what I was saying earlier. I can fly into the Orlando airport and I can tell somebody sitting next to me, I was one of the engineers that helped design the mechanical systems for the uh, airport. Mm. I can go into the um, Barnes Art Museum in Philadelphia, which is right down the street from the uh, Rocky Stairs, and say I was one of the engineers that designed that. I can go into multiple people's homes. I can go into multiple churches and say, yeah, I was one of the engineers that basically makes the building get hot in wintertime and get cold in the summertime. I can drive. If you've ever been to Brooklyn or downtown Miami, I can go to the Panorama Tower. I can go to the SLS Tower. I can go to the uh, SLS Lux. These are all 60 and 70 story high rise luxurious buildings and say, I was one of the engineers that basically worked in those buildings. So to me, the dopest thing about being an engineer is that the entire world gets to look at what you design mm. and say, that's pretty bad. And that's a it's a feeling that never um it's a feeling that never gets old. And it started um, hold on, but yeah. that started from when you were a kid. You were talking about how you saw the pyramids and you're like, who built that? Like you had from a young age, you liked building things. Is that what I'm getting from you? Definitely. I, I was that kid and definitely I played with Lego girls and I went to play basketball. I was that kid. Yeah. So yep. Yeah. So I mean if you have a kid that loves to build loves to create and and likes to see what they build you need to foster that in your kid and 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 and, and push them you know maybe through to engineering yes that may require you to heavily hit them in math at an early age right you, yeah. it's going to require math at an early age oh, absolutely agreed my i was about three or four classes away from being a math minor so yeah you take a lot of math and engineering but i can also say this science i think it's the same way um, the 21st century jobs are STEM, the science, the technology, the internet, and math, and I would say the healthcare, because people are being born, are going to be dying. So um, for my career anyway, I literally get job offers 
every other day. I mean, I've had three people call me within the last 24 hours saying, Chris, we have opportunity for you want to take it. Whether it's the Midwest, the Northeast, the Southeast, the uh, West Coast, um, I mean, everywhere. So in general, I find that um, as engineers, I mean, in the STEM field, those are 21st century jobs. So to all my parents out there that are listening, if you want your child to have a phenomenal chance to be heavily employed in this 21st century workforce, because let's face it, right now, we're not Alabama or Tony in Delaware, we're competing against guys in Nigeria, guys in Dubai, people in Australia, people all over the world. STEM is a phenomenal field to go into because people always think we need more engineers, we need more minority engineers, we need more, more minority nurses, we need more minority doctors, we need more minority people going into sciences because those are the 21st century jobs. Absolutely. The economy did not affect us at all. Yeah, it, it's, it can't be outsourced. It can't be outsourced. Can't be outsourced. All right, guys. Thanks. Yo, Chris, thank you so much. You did such a good job. I'm going to put out some questions. Right? I, I, yeah, I love the loves. Can I get some more loves? I know you can't see this, Chris, but people are, like, really responding to what you're saying. Um, I see Kim. I see Jemuel. I see my dad, Julian. I see Charmaine, Karen. It's good to see you all out here. Um, any questions? Uh, my dad says, flood your sons with Legos. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Start buying some Legos and let have them build stuff. That's right. Actually, my, it's funny because uh, I have a nephew who's uh, seven and I have a niece. She's five. And every year I buy Mike and Amaya Legos or Sim toys. Yeah. Stuff that they did. I, I, get, I don't get them like the tip. I always buy them Legos or some kind of like 21st century Programming type of toys to like five or six year olds. So yeah, start start them early. Some of my parents out there. Those toys definitely exist. Yeah, they they exist. Um, I see a lot of comments, but not many questions. You know, people were talking about how um, networking is key, and um, they appreciate your real talk about you know black tax. Um, what somebody said that. Uh, they were an Afro like myself, and they said that they look rebellious. I'm in academia, so I have a little bit more liberty. Um, do you feel that the need to be more corporate like, the pressure to feel Absolutely. more in corporate? So, you guys probably have trouble uh, imagining this, but when I graduated, um, Alan Iverson was kind of on his way out of the NBA. So, when I graduated, if anyone knows Alan Iverson, he made corn rolls popular. So, when I was graduating from college, my grades. Well, I had braids at the time. My hang time, basically, basically my braids stopped below my shoulders. So every girl that I dated in college, for the most part, after my sophomore year, I had longer hair than them because I had cornrows. So when I would take my fro out, my hair would literally be like out to there. <laughs> so I, I, interviewed about, I interviewed with about six different companies, and all six of them did not hire me. Mm. The second I cut my cornrows, I got every job that I interviewed with that. Literally, every company I interviewed with after I cut my braids. Wow. And to the people's credit, the individuals who I interviewed with, they made it very clear. Mr. Phelps, we have no problem with your braids. You will be a welcome addition to our company. But they didn't hire me. As soon as I cut my hair, the next <laughs> week, every job that I interviewed with, I got job offers. Wow. I've had situations where people have told me, um, Chris, you're a tall, athletic, black guy. I'm about 62, um, 185 pounds or whatever. Um, they said, you're a tall, athletic, black guy. Um, if you raise your voice, people are going to be scared. So when you do your interview, talk in a much more feminine way. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> and literally, and that was basically the stuff that I've been told. I've had friends who basically have not been hired at like six to five, six to six, and always in the back of their, these are African-American men, always in the back of their brain, they think to themselves, okay, is, are they scared of a physical threat or what? So um, I would like to tell you that it, does, that, 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 that it doesn't exist, but unfortunately, I do think that element does still exist in our society, but I will also tell you this. Your game needs to be so tight that people almost have to ignore the color of your skin and mm. ignore whatever racial whatever that they have. I mm. thank God for the fact that um, as an engineer, I have a lot of credentials behind my name. And as a result, when people see my resume, they automatically they call me because they go, this guy is very, very, very um, qualified. And when I think of the phone and answer the phone, I can tell like about a two-second pause just to start like, buddy, look, you're my lord. You're right. <laughs> So, yeah. And Chris Phelps, you know, Chris Phelps doesn't sound like a black guy, right? Michael Phelps. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, You're Michael Phelps' brother. It's a very racially ambiguous name. Yeah. Once again, it gets back to my point, though. The game has to be so tight 
as far as your internships, as far as your scholarship opportunities, as far as your job, as far as your work experience, as far as your potential behind your name. Your game has to be so tight that people basically have to ignore the color of your skin. Barack Obama graduated from Harvard, dang, you're very close to the top of his class. He always made her grade. When he was got to college, he made phenomenal grades. He was a community organizer. He had a lot of different credentials or whatever that qualified him when he applied for his first law firm. So as a result, I'm sure having the name Barack Obama in the 70s and 80s probably was not the most um, I don't know. <laughs> right, yeah. popular, right. The game has to be so tight that regardless of what your skin color is, people can't say, um, okay, this is crazy. And I can tell you this, having a lot of Latino friends, they deal with the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. One person won't want to hire them because they don't want to hire Nunez. They don't want to hire a Pedro. They don't want to hire um, Pierre's because, oh, this person might speak Spanish or this person might be this, this, or this. Your game has to be so tight that people can't, they, um, that people have to basically say, okay, I don't care what you look like. I need this for my company. You fit the description. I'm going to hire you. And I don't care what you look like, what your background is. Excellence. That's, that's what I want to end on. Excellence. That's what we need. And that's what Phenomenal STEMist is all about. It's the word phenomenal. We have to be phenomenal. Yep, agreed. God calls us to be the head and not the tail, guys. So um, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. What was your response to people who would tell you that, that you can't do it? What was your response? I always looked at it like this. I was, um, I was a statistic that made it. So if I can go through the environments and the situations that I got through, when I got to college, there was nothing stopping me. I mean, it's as simple as that. And that's why I say it gets back to that whole minority experience, because let's be honest. If you are a minority, you're dealing with a lot more factors than, unfortunately, um, mainstream Americans are dealing with. So if you get to that point where you get to college, you can study. All you can focus on is studying and everything. All you can focus on is basically staying there. You basically have a leg up with somebody who grew up in a quote-unquote stable two-parent house or grew up in a quote-unquote safe environment. So, um... That's more or less how you deal with the challenges. Does that answer the question, Marty? But how did you respond to like somebody who said that you can't do it? Ignore them. I mean, <laughs> you can professionally, you can professionally um, attack them. You can professionally check them if you want to. But in general, success is the best way to shut up haters. It's just as simple as that. You want to make somebody mad? Be successful. You want to tick off a, um, a person who does not like you? Go out there and do what they said that you could not do. And I can say from being a professional, if you really want to really want to bother somebody, find it, um, start a business. Start a business and then compete against an employer who basically said that you could get that position, you could get that promotion. That's what I did. So um, that's pretty much the way that you attack people who say that, um, okay, you can't do it. Somebody's telling you can't do something. That's basically God's way of saying you need to work harder to do it. Wow. I love that. Ignore them and succeed and then compete with them and take their business. I love it. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> oh, well, that's pretty much it. Time's running out. I'm so happy that you were here, Mr. Uh, Christopher Phelps. Um, we really enjoyed you. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, tonight, I'm wondering if you like Monday versus Sunday, guys. I'm going to do Sunday nights from now on, but, you know, tell me in the comments if you prefer on a Monday night. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Chris. This was great. I am, and he is uh, the phenomenal STEMist. Have a good night, guys. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Maya, anytime, okay? Thanks. Good luck with everybody out there in your careers and your professions, okay? Work hard, keep God first, and keep everything. So, no. Thank you. Thank Anytime, you. Anytime. Anytime.